thanks everyone for coming to this uh, discussion meeting on Iranian and Russian involvement in Syria, prospects and purposes. The, um, this, this is part of a series we've been having about the issues that will be forming the backdrop to the IISS Manama Dialogue taking place December 8th through 10th. Uh, we've discussed uh, some of the issues regarding uh, the counterterrorism um, uh, issue, the Iranian issue, and uh, today a uh, focus uh, intently on uh, the Syria problem. We are joined by uh, two experts um, on their respective subjects. Uh, to my right, Dr. Mark Katz is a professor of government and politics at the George Mason University Shar School of Policy and Government. Uh, Mark, over the past 35 years, has been focusing intently on Moscow's relations with the Middle East, especially the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Peninsula. I remember we met for the first time in Riyadh three years ago, uh, but it's taking me this long to, uh, to get you over here to talk. Uh, Mark is off to the United Kingdom in early 2018, first to be a Fulbright Scholar at the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS, in uh, London, and then as a fellow at Durham University. To my left, Dr. Uh, Neda Berlucci is a research associate at the Interdisciplinary Center for Innovative Theory and Empirics at Columbia University. At the center, she continues her research examining how religion, modes of violence, economic development, and institutions of law affect state society relations and political events. Neda completed several years of archival research and oral history work in Iran, Syria, and Armenia for her doctoral dissertation as well as her law degree. She has forthcoming articles slated for publication in the Journal of the American Academy of Religion, the Islamic Monthly, Encyclopedia Iranica, and the Iranian Studies Journal. She consults for a variety of news organizations and agencies, news agencies and organizations. So we're going to um, uh, go for an hour. Each of the speakers will um, offer some initial comments and then we'll have a discussion. The uh, meeting is on the record. It's being recorded and will be posted on the IISS website afterwards. So Mark, if you could uh, start us off, please. Hold the microphone. All right. Thanks, Mark. It's very nice to, to be here, to see some old friends uh, in the audience as well, uh, some of whom I first met 35 or so years ago. Anyway, John, good to see you. Uh, I'm going to focus here on, on Russia. Uh, Russia and Iran have uh, cooperated closely in Syria. A combination of ground forces from Iran with, and its various Shia militia allies, plus primarily air forces from Russia, have succeeded in preventing the Assad regime from being overthrown. Uh, they've helped regain uh, much of the control over the much of the territory that's been lost, putting the Arab opposition to Assad in particular on the defensive. Russia, along with Iran and Turkey, uh, dominating the conflict uh, resolution process, both through the Astana talks and uh, more recently the de-escalation zones agreed upon in uh, May 2017. Now, the initial hopes of the Trump administration that somehow it could persuade Russia to work with the U.S. Uh, against Iran uh, were quickly dashed. Uh, this was hardly an attractive offer to Moscow, not only because accepting it would undercut the perception of Russia as a loyal ally to its friends, but also because it would make Russia look subordinate to the U.S. And now that they're prevailing in Syria, there's little incentive for Russia to move away from Iran at Washington's behest. Uh, even Iran's continued presence in Syria is useful to Russia, not just for making sure that the Assad regime remains in place and its adversaries don't grow strong again, but also because the Iranian presence in Syria makes the Russian presence there more palatable to others, who would be far less happy if Iran dominated Syria all on its own. Still, there are signs of friction between Russia and Iran on some issues. In addition to uh, Turkey being uncomfortable with Russian and, of course, American support for the Syrian Kurds, Iran is also not all that well pleased with this. Further, Russia's willingness to allow Turkey to play a role in Syria can be seen not just as a part of Moscow's hopes to exploit Turkish Western differences, but also as hedging uh, against Iran, uh, balancing against Iran in Syria. Prior to the upcoming Russian-Turkish-Iranian summit in Sochi, 
Turkish President Erdogan indicated that with regard to the 12 observation zone spots that have been agreed upon in their de-escalation zones, he said, we show flexibility toward the demands of Russia and even of Iran, but we don't take into account Iran's demands on Afrin. This is uh, just to the north of uh, Idlib. Because Russia made us promises about withdrawal from Afrin at the G20 summit in Hamburg. Now, if true, what this indicates is that Moscow is willing to make an agreement with Turkey about Syria without consulting Iran uh, on something that affects Iranian interests. The November 2017 U.S.-Russia Jordan agreement that Iranian forces along with its Shia allies would keep away from the Golan Heights uh, may be another example. On this, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov subsequently seemed to backtrack, stating that the Iranian presence in Syria could remain both because it was sanctioned by the so-called legitimate Syrian government and because Iran is an ally against the jihadists. But while Lavrov indicated that Iranian forces could stay in Iran, he didn't seem to repudiate the understanding that they would not be present on the Golan Heights, which Israel is highly concerned about. Indeed, Russian willingness to accommodate Israeli concerns in Syria, including uh, sitting back while it targets Hezbollah forces in particular, is another instance of where Russia and Iranian interests differ. None of this is reassuring to Tehran. Uh, I was recently participated in a, uh, one of the second track conferences where there was a, a Russia watcher from Iran who, who talked about this. And what he indicated was that while Tehran uh, is very concerned uh, about Russian behavior, but that, of course, Iran is not exactly in a position to break with, with Russia. Still, uh, he does see a quiet competition emerging uh, between Russia and Iran for influence uh, in Syria. He saw Moscow and Tehran as having different uh, allies. Moscow, he claimed, was in the stronger position due to its close ties with Syria's armed forces and bureaucracy. But Tehran, he suggested, is closer to Assad and his entourage because they see Iran as more loyal supporters than Russia, which has indicated that it is not completely happy with Assad and could envision a power-sharing ag agreement in which he played a lesser role. Uh, in addition, uh, Iran is building a Syrian Hezbollah and is also training Syrian Shia clerics in Iran. Iran's competition with Russia, uh, while continuing to cooperate with it, would play out over a long period of time, but he saw Iran as more likely to stay engaged in Syria than Russia in the long run. After all, Iran is nearby. Russia's uh, history of involvement in the Middle East tends to be episodic. They get involved, they withdraw, they get involved again. For its part, Moscow seemed less interested in trying to push Iran out of Syria than maintaining Russian influence there through balancing among the various other actors, whether it's Iran, Turkey, Israel, the Gulf Arabs, the United States. Moscow does not seek uh, complete dominance but a situation in which everyone uh, else prefers Russia to some other external power there. And I, in, in, I argue that this is sort of, Russia has a different approach to playing the role of a great power, at least far from its borders. And that is, it doesn't seek to dominate any particular region, it seeks to balance among different actors within a region by playing essentially the actor that everyone has to turn to. Uh, in other words, that either you appease Russia they do something worse for you, that everyone has an interest in, in working with Russia. Putin has managed this balancing act quite well so far, but with a near defeat of everyone's common enemy, ISIS, it may be more difficult to do this in the future. Specifically, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's insistence uh, that Israel will act forcefully to prevent an increased Iranian military presence in Syria may push Moscow to make a clear choice between Iran and Israel, which it does not want ha to have to make, especially since it benefits from cooperation with both. In other words, that, that it's, 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 I think, not as well appreciated in the West, but that Russian-Israeli cooperation really is pretty, pretty deep. Uh, Israel is one of the few sources of Western military technology for Russia. They have an important trade relationship. Um, some of Russia's arms exports are enhanced with Israeli technology. This is not something that they want to interrupt. And I think in the same thing, of course, there's lots of reasons to cooperate with Iran. And it seems that, that what the Russians have, have 
often uh, striven to do, it's a, to bilateralize each of their relationships. You don't like that we're cooperating with this guy? Well, we'll cooperate with you as well. Right? That seems to be the approach. And of course, no one likes the fact that, that they're cooperating with their adversary, but what the Russians are counting on is that they hate their adversary so much that they'll put up with Russia, Russia's behavior in this regard. Why don't I stop there? Thanks very much, Mark. That's um, uh, a lot on the table there and uh, a lot to dig into. Um, but before we do that, uh, we'll ask uh, Nada to give uh, a perspective about uh, the Iranian involvement. Great. Thank you very much. Um, the sort of the advertisement for our talk was about fragility in terms of Iranian-Russian relations. And so my talk is based on the fact that I actually don't see any fragility happening. Uh, in terms of these relationships. There are innumerable unknowns. I think Mark has touched on a number of those. Uh, and numerous influence, uh, actors trying to influence the outcome of this relationship and create some fragility. But in the short to medium term, I don't see this relationship changing. I don't see fragility um, happening. So I do disagree with the operative word in terms of fragility. But what I will say is that there's going to be significant tension, particularly in terms of the borders. Um, both sides will have to make concessions to each other, and those will be tense moments, but they're also likely to remain hidden and opaque as both countries operate behind a veneer um, that we're accustomed to seeing. So there have been about six suggestions on how to create a schism so that we have some sense of fragility in Iranian-Russian relations. Um, first, I'd just to backtrack a little bit. Uh, to understand the Iranian position in Syria. It's not just about Shiism. Uh, this is a long-term strategic defensive policy that Iran is in Syria. Uh, it has believed that the American position was basically to target Iran, that if Assad goes down, it weakens Iran, ultimately, at best, and at worst, it's about regime change. And so that's why Iran is absolutely entrenched in Syria. It's why it's going to have a pragmatic relationship with Russia. It will concede a number of things, because ultimately, as long as Syria stands with Assad there, not necessarily for life, but Iran sees itself as being relatively safe in the long term. Um, and so in that sense, it is pragmatic. Uh, and going back a little bit further, and that's why it started it sided with Armenia over Azerbaijan and Nagorno-Karabakh. It is ultimately a pragmatic uh, government that really wants to maintain its longevity. Uh, so this is also why the Russians and the Iranians have a decades-long relationship. It is solid. Um, but And for this reason, Iran was able to bring Russia into this war. Uh, despite the ongoing competition between the two for the European natural gas market. Again, Iran is playing the long game. Um, and they're concerned less about what Russia may do vis-a-vis -vis economics with Iran, but more about geopolitics from Israel, Turkey, and Saudi Arabia. So Iran will use Russia against those three and will concede certain things to Russia vis-a-vis -vis those three countries. Um, but to the larger point of Iran's relationships, uh, relationship with Russia, Iran was able to convince Russia to get in, to spend the money, the time, the air force power. So Iran is obviously making a convincing argument, and Russia is listening. Um, the next thing is that uh, Russia, Iran, on its part, as it's going to negotiate with Russia about certain things, will remind Russia how much it's gained. So from Latakia to Tar <clears throat> Tartus, Russia is winning out in, this, in its involvement in Syria. Um, it's gotten geographical spaces and power it hasn't had even during the Soviet era. Uh, the 1971 agreement in Tartus has been extended. So Russia now has uh, the concession uh, 49 years. Uh, not only does it have Tartus, but it has sovereignty over the Tartus port. So this means that it's going to control dredging, installing floating berths, carrying out repair work, expanding the port's capacity. It can only hold about th uh, 300, the ships of 300 feet now. This, given five years, if it works at full speed, will allow uh, Tartus to hold 11 warships, uh, including those with nuclear capability. So this is an enormous thing that Russia has won because Iran has brought it into Syria. Um, so in addition to Tartus, you also have uh, SAMs that are being positioned. So this is, again, vis-a-vis -vis Europe and NATO, things that Russia had not gotten before, things that it's, one, it's been on its target list. And as a result of Iran bringing it in, it has gotten. Uh, and those are the things that Iranians will remind the Russians of. 
Um, there's also been discussion that the idea of oil profits as well as gas reserves may potentially create a schism between the two uh, in the same way that my previous point says that it doesn't, this will also not happen. Um, Russia has the concessions over the Eastern Mediterranean Syrian reserves for gas. Uh, it's a done deal, whether it goes ahead and does the survey surveying um, and develops them, which can be extremely costly, but in the long run, it increases Russia's control over the gas market. It's so even if it doesn't develop them, that's a competitor not on the market. Um, and so Russia has locked that down as well. Um, and we're talking about 1.7 billion barrels or 122 trillion cubic feet of gas that are now uh, newly added, even if it's not developed, but it's off the market and under Russian control. Uh, again, another thing that Iran will remind Russia of. Um, one place that I do thoroughly agree there's potential for tension is really about the day-to-day -day operations in Syria. Iran will want to try and run a parallel infrastructure to the Syrian government like it does in Iran itself. So it'll be based off of the Basij, and neither Russia nor Assad will want this. They don't want sectarianism. They don't want a parallel institution running alongside its own government. Um, and so there will be pushback here, I think, in this sense that um, Iran has a massive network in Syria on the ground. Um, on a meta level, uh, R Russia has been in the air, Iran on the ground. So that network, um, I'm, I'm not going to say that the land bridge fully exists, but you just saw Soleimani up in Deir Zor, Iran in the south. They're not going to cut Iran as Syria into sort of traditional imperial enclaves of one country in one area and another country in the area. They will have these overlapping concentric circles. And as a result, the Russians will try, and Assad will want the Russians to keep the sectarianism out of Syria, right? That the Iran will try to convert and co-opt Syrians along the way, uh, either into Shiism or to be more uh, amenable to ir Iranian interests. And in the short term, uh, rather than saying Iran pull back in terms of social services, you can actually see, what I expect to see is actually a doubling down. Iran will be putting in more money into Syria. Uh, it will be delivering more social services if it's allowed. And this is an area where I think the Russians and Assad will have to push back against Iran to make sure it's not a sectarian delivery of social services, that the messaging stays relatively even keeled. Um, and I think on the day-to-day -day operations, this is where you're going to have more tension. Um, and um, the next thing I think will be the borders. Uh, that Mark talked about and I think everyone is largely concerned about. Uh, I think that the, um, you will see Iran running basically as it has been all over Syria. Um, everyone's been talking about the El Kiswa barracks. In, it's about 14 kilometers south of Damascus. So it's not quite on the borders. Everyone's been saying five kilometers away from Golan, 10 kilometers away from Jordan. So El Qaswa is 15 kilometers south of Damascus, so it's not nearly as close to the borders as people have been expecting. There's no overt signaling that there are Iranians there, but it is a buildup. There's new construction's been going on all year. There's no advanced military hardware there, but I think we all see that the Iranian forces and militias have to go somewhere. They need housing. It makes sense that this would be one of the places that they go. Um, and so it brings back into mind that the negotiations that are going on are really going to be about how much Iran is going to be allowed to stay in Syria, which is not negotiable to Russia because it benefits Russia, right? The more, as Mark said, if Iran is there, it gives reason for Russia to be there as sort of the bulwark. But simultaneously, there will be a little bit pushback because of the strategic relationships that Russia has with Turkey and with Israel to the extent that they can get that Jordan can use those relationships to also get Iran off of its border will come into play. But I don't think that Russia is going to agree or Iran is going to agree to stay in Damascus or north of Damascus. So I do, so it will be, I think, a tense moment that we will not necessarily see a lot of, but expect Iran to be south of Damascus. Um, and then one of the other things that has been floated 
uh, about how the U.S. can reinsert itself, uh, how it can pressure Russia is to get involved with the loans in reconstruction and rebuilding. This is a non-starter. Um, first of all, Assad has said that people who were against him and his government are not going to win politically where they failed militarily. Uh, the Geneva process has basically also made this a non-starter. The sanctions came too hard, too fast, trying to unravel them uh, in time for short-term loans is not going to happen. Uh, Russia and Iran will not want this either. Um, so discussions of using loans in the international system to reinsert American or Euro-American influence uh, is not going to create any sort of schism between Russia, Iran, uh, and Syria. And then I think something that came up in October is the Saudi agreement with Russia for SAM 400 system uh, and the potential that Saudi purchase, military purchases will sway Russia away from Iran. Again, not a, as a non-starter um, in the sense that Iran has been doing military purchases for decades. This is a long-term strategic relationship. It is not of convenience. Uh, they are wedded together. They both have their pragmatic moments and opportunities as how they can advance their own um, initiatives and checklists. But an initial purchase that hasn't happened but is being discussed and is just an MOU uh, is not swaying Russia uh, to Saudi Arabia. Diversifying its weaponry is also not, that, that's something that will have to be looked at over the long term and uh, will require more than just money. Iran has shown that it is uh, a reliable partner to Russia, it's on the ground, uh, and it does a lot of the heavy lifting that, for the most part, we won't see Saudi Arabia doing. Um, and so for all of those reasons, I think that that relationship is, is pretty tight. Uh, it's not showing fragility. Like I said, there will be some tense moments, but for the most part, um, there's a lot of work to be done. Thanks very, thanks very much, uh, Neda. You, um, you went through very carefully the six reasons um, uh, why the, um, the fragility uh, that some had hoped for uh, isn't going to prevail. Mark uh, Katz started off saying that uh, the Trump administration had, had hoped to, uh, to drive a wedge between uh, Russia and Iran and quickly uh, failed. And I, I'm, I'm guessing that you also will see uh, not too much of a, of a prospect for uh, any of these six areas. But if you have a difference I, I hope, uh, on any of these six, I hope you'll, you'll enlighten us. But let me start off the, the discussion with, a di with another question. Uh, Iran is very much uh, pictured as uh, an agent of, uh, of trouble in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the word uh, Iran's malign uh, behavior is, uh, became a, become a catchphrase. And uh, its involvement in, in Syria is, is one of the, uh, the typical uh, areas, uh, Exhibit A, as it were. Russia's involvement has not attracted as much attention. And I guess I want to ask Mark, why, why is Russia off the hook in terms of the American narrative or the, uh, the, the, the Gulf Arab states, uh, Israeli narrative uh, about actors who are behaving malignly? Has, has Russia behaved itself with, with greater um, uh, uh, attention to uh, reducing uh, uh, civilian deaths in its air campaigns and so forth? Thank you, Mark. I think that that's a that's a great question because I have to admit I have often wondered why is it if what Iran does is bad, what Russia does is somehow okay in terms of certainly the way the Israelis and and the Gulf Arabs and and even the Americans to a certain extent look at it. And I think that you know as, as I tried to suggest that that. Uh, um, you know, we have anecdotal evidence that, that Russians have been making arguments to Israelis and to Gulf Arabs that, you know, look, you're unhappy that the Iranians are there. Well, it's a good thing that we're there to keep, uh, to keep them in check. Now, it's not, not an, an argument I'm sure they make with the Iranians at all. But I think that, you know, what we know is that the Russians do say different things to different people. And I also think that um, whereas, you know, I agree with, with Netta very much that we're not going to see uh, Russia moving away from Iran, I think it's very much in Russia's interest to let people hope in this regard, that they, they, they dangle this possibility. And I think it's been a bedrock of s the Saudi approach to Russia all along that Russia is 
Putin in particular is motivated by money and that if only the Saudis offer a good enough deal, surely a rational actor would move away from Iran to work with the Saudis. That would be so much better. Uh, and so I think that um, uh, you know, they, they do this. And of course, you know, uh, that I talked about, okay, there's the, the S-400 deal, and, and I fully agree that you know, we're not sure whether it's going to be completed or not. But I think that what everyone has noticed is that, oh, Russia is willing to sell S-400s to Saudi Arabia and Turkey, but only S-300s to Iran. There's that there, there is sort of a certain noticeable difference there, it seems to me. So I think that this is um, part of the way in which, in which the, the Russians operate, that they, they, you know, there, there are people who, who, there are governments, our own included, who want to believe that they can draw Russia away from Iran. And I think that the Russians um, play on this. Uh, and I, certainly, you know, just last, last week there was a, a presentation by someone at the, from the National Security Council at the National Bureau for Asian Research indicating that, that they, they see that Russia's desire for American contribution to the uh, reconstruction of, of Syria as a... Uh, a means, a lever to move Russia away from Iran. So they're still hoping this, and I and I submit that the Russians are are not discouraging this belief. Thanks, Mark. Um, we'll uh, we'll open to discussion from anyone who might have a comment or a question. Um, uh, state your name and affiliation, and uh, and a question that I can then uh, recapitulate uh, uh, for the uh, the benefit of the. Uh, um, the recording. So, uh, in the front row. Um, wait. Yeah, actually, go ahead. Use the microphone. That might be better. Okay. Uh, question for uh, Nada. You you characterize the strategic importance um, of Syria to Iran, <coughs> which uh, clearly does go back decades, um, and uh, and it clearly does go beyond the the affiliation, um, the religious affiliations. Um, but you characterize it more as a defensive strategic relationship. I think that uh, most people one talks to in the Arab world uh, see it as an offensive relationship, um, one in which uh, Iran uses Syria to project power uh, and uses Syria to uh, extend its influence into, of course, Lebanon through Hezbollah and uh, into the Levant and, and the Mediterranean generally, and, and putting pressure on Israel as well. Um, and I wonder if you could address that aspect of the, uh, of the relationship as well. About, sorry, my name's Chris Eichem with CBN. Uh, Nita, try, try using this and see if it'll work. Um, thanks, Chris. So the Iranians see it as defensive. And one thing uh, I'd mentioned to Mark, so let me go ahead and say it now. Some of this is Iran's tit for tat. Right, so Iran on the border, Iran's placement in Syria is, is I'm going to swing back to the, your question about offensive, but for in that to their mind, it's defensive, right? So stemming from uh, it initially may have been offensive as part of the revolution in '79, we're going to export uh, Shia revolutionarism, but it became a defensive mechanism during the Iran Iraq War, in that Iran sees itself and saw itself as taking on, in essence, the world and the sort of the casualties that it suffered as a result of that war. And so in order not to repeat that potentiality, Iran, as a, what it considers a defensive mechanism, went on offense. So by positioning itself in Syria, by having proxies in Lebanon, nobody really, and if we look back at the Bush administration period, the reason why, despite all of the buildup to the, towards the possibility of an invasion in Iran that nobody would actually pull the trigger on is because no one knew what was going to happen in Lebanon, in Israel, and in Syria because of those. And that, in that sense, that's defense. That is exactly defense by going on the offense. It prepared itself, and because of this asymmetrical uh, tactic of warfare, Iran is prepared, Iran um, is entrenched, and then that way no one's going to attack it or invade it again. And so that's how they see it. And that's why it makes worth doubling down on its uh, work in Syria and extending its social services. Part of the, sometimes when I talk about is for everyone who talks about the Shia populations, well, if you actually provide social services to the Shia populations in your country, Iran doesn't have an inroad. I mean, if we look at Lebanon in the 1950s, southern Lebanon, they had nothing. And that's how Iran got in. 
So for Iran, they go on the offensive, they do the social services, and it provides them a protective wall. And so, and the, and the larger part of that is, as long as everybody is focused on what Iran's doing in Syria and in Lebanon, they're not going to bother Iran in Iran. They're not going to come onto its borders. They're not going to come into its country. And so all the money spent elsewhere is absolutely worth it. And it's part of its long-term governmental security apparatus. It's not just the Iranian borders, but the Islamic Republic. Right? It's about protecting that. And so that's the defensive nature of it. So let me just push on this a bit, because there's a bit of a contradiction. It, it, on the one hand, you say it's tit for tat. Uh, Iran is being pressed, and so they're, they're pressing back. On the other hand, you say it's defensive and necessary. If it's tit for tat, then uh, Iran doesn't have to stay there. There, there. there could be a, you know, they don't have to keep that barracks there, and maybe there's a deal to be struck, or maybe they'll leave if they get pressured, or if the Israelis uh, you know, find that too, um, too close to them themselves. So some of this, it's not just, it's largely about the United States and the U.S. and Israel's uh, relationship and the, the constant discussion of invading Iran. So Iran will sit on that border because the United States has surrounded Iran for decades. This is the tit for tat. And as long as it's sitting on that border, it's a defensive mechanism, right? So it may never do anything. For the most part, it will just sit there to say, we can sit here. And you have to constantly be concerned about us. And that creates a mental state of, what are they doing? How do we deal with them? And it creates a larger opportunities, economic and political opportunities, for Iran, for Russia, to do other things. And so in that sense, it is tit for tat, decades coming tit for tat, with the United States and with Israel. And because the years of the war were not handled well, they have this opportunity. And they're just going to, I don't think that they're going to back away off of those borders. Okay, then, uh, front row here. Um, I'm Rowan Rujule. I'm a Syrian American um, independent researcher. Thank you for this interesting panel. Uh, my question is um, is to comment on the last uh, question that you, sir, raised and uh, address it to Ms. Nadal. Um, I think the problem with the Iranian versus the Russians, and that's been unfolded in Syria, is for the Syrians been raised as Arabs and the nationalism. They see Iranians not only um, first or Persian, but also it's an extension for an um, religious identity, extreme identity, Sunni versus Shia. And that's, I think, the danger, the danger between uh, why we, we in the United States see uh, Iranian are more dangerous than Russians. Um, I don't know if you've been following, but uh, a lot of Alawites and a lot of Syrian Alawites have been defecting from uh, the Iranians um, and going to the Russians. They don't want to be affiliated. Um, my question is, yes, I agree on the six points, but on the long run and with the social services, do you, and I think that the Shiite uh, population in Syria is less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Do you think that really the Syrians that have been lived on Arabism, nationalism for 40 years will accept um, taking into consideration the new two axes in the region, you know, the Saudi, Israeli, uh, American versus the Russian, Turkish, uh, and Iranian? Do you think that really will, uh, will hold in the long run that Iranian and, and Russians will, will still hold their interests together? So this is a, a question to both, because Mark, I'd like you to comment on uh, Syria acceptance of a Russian ongoing presence, the sovereignty over the port. Uh, are the Russians seen as outsiders who have now become accepted as a, a long-term presence? But if you could first address the question. Sure. Raised. Um, I think that the Syrians are going to have, uh, the Syrian population in general has had and will have issues with Iran. So the more that you move away from Damascus and certain pockets where you have a Shia stronghold uh, or away from the seminaries, uh, you will see that there's actually virulent anti-Iranian sentiment. That um, you, you know, Syria has a, a very mixed population that has had um, so much influence from the Saudis and the Turks. Uh, familial as well as political, are going to have massive problems with the Iranian attempt at co-option and coercion. And so some of, and this will be one of the reasons why Assad and Russia will on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, win over the Iranians 
and make them understand that, yes, you can deliver the social services, but your insistence of delivering it with any sort of Shia-themed um, outreach is not going to work well. So from Deir Azor all the way down, the, ma the majority of the country is more than suspicious. They're hostile. And so this is going to give Iran um, a lot, is going to cause Iran to pause, but it doesn't mean that it's not going to be running its network. And so I don't see, again, in the long term, that ho the population's hostility uh, as affecting the Russian-Assad-Iranian relationship. If Iran, Iran will have to back down because Assad and Russia want them to in terms of the Shiism. But overall, it's going to hold. Thanks, Nada. And Mark, the mic coming. Great. Thank you very much. I think you raised some very important issues. And certainly, you know, we, we've known from the, you know, obviously the history of many developing countries, countries in the Arab world, that, that foreign bases are clearly problematic. On the other hand, I think that what, what many Russians see is that uh, um, the Iranian presence in, in Syria does worry a lot of Alawites as well, and that therefore for them Russia is the better alternative. In other words, that of course you know the, the bases are in essentially you know Alawi territory, and so that in in a certain sense it's it's a Russian commitment to the the Alawites and, and other communities, Christian communities, as well uh, against you know not not just simply the the Sunnis but also against the Iranians. So I think that in in, in that sense. The Russians um, are, are, don't really have to worry so much uh, uh, in this regard. Thanks, Mark. Um, Stanley Kobar in the fourth row. Um, there's a saying attributed to Napoleon. You can do everything with a bayonet except sit on it. There are lots of bayonets <coughs> in Syria now. There are lots of bayonets in the neighborhood. And Saudi Arabia, other Gulf countries have told their citizens, get out of Lebanon. This is reminiscent of 1973, when the Soviets withdrew their diplomatic personnel immediately prior to the outbreak of the war. I am wondering how long people will sit on those bayonets. Thanks, Stanley. We, we uh, were talking beforehand uh, about this sense of uncertainty that has uh, come over the Middle East and uh, uh, a, a, a sense of something uh, is going to be, and happen, making it worse, but nobody knows exactly what or when, and uh, some of the players themselves uh, not really knowing. But, Nate, do you have a view on this? I, mean, I think one thing that's missing from the conversation is China. Um, and so, you have in Iran and Russia two exporters, right? And so anybody who's an exporter wants the prices of everything to go up. I mean, if we just look at things economically, they're going to want the prices to go up, but neither of them are going to want any conflict within their own borders. Again, this is why Iran is in Syria. And so China, though, as we saw recently, has, or I think over the weekend, came out and said, you know, what's going on in Saudi Arabia is not erratic. They're taking the necessary reforms. Um, China, as the world's largest importer, does, is going to, I think, do everything it can to keep things calm in the Middle East. So everyone, I think, will be selling arms, and it will be tinderboxes across the region, but I think you will also see a lot of people working to make sure nothing goes astray. And I also think for all the rhetoric of this administration, it also does not want to see a war. And so you have the two biggest uh, sort of... Uh, superpowers not in the Middle East, but who are in the Middle East, don't want a war. And so um, I think that some of that we have to start talking a little bit about China's interests and what it's doing that we're also not seeing. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have any answer except to say we should probably get a China expert. <laughs> um, I, well, I'll have another question from the floor, and then I'll follow up uh, a little bit later. But Mark, um, a, a comment on this. <clears throat> Right. You know, I, I think that, uh, well, re really two things. Um, you know, there's now a, a new book by the two Israeli journalists, uh, Ginor and Remez, talking about the lead up to the 1973 war. All those Soviet planes that took the people out of Egypt, 
They were bringing arms and men into Egypt at the same time. <laughs> they weren't exactly retreating. And I think it's, it's, it's sufficient now because you know, you're talking about Saudis and other Gulf countries asking their, ordering their people to leave. They're not sending their forces there. In other words, they're not really preparing for war. They're, they're trying to, you know, it, it, any sort of you know, wider conflict between Saudi Arabia and Iran, Saudi Arabia doesn't have many advantages. The only way this can make sense is if somehow the United States is drawn into it. And I really don't think that the Trump administration uh, is willing to do this, that, that, that what all this, this, this talk of is about, it seems to me, is the Saudis and the Israelis seem to want, they, they want to have, you know, the Trump administration express its commitment. They see this as, as deterring Iran. In other words, Iran is, you know, setting up little places in Syria. They want this to be kept within bounds. I think it's more part of a, their own psychological uh, campaign against Iran, and, and, and partly to reassure themselves. But I don't think that uh, the situations are, are similar. Thanks, Mark. So in the, in the back row here, the gentleman in the fourth row. Hi, John Parker at the NDU INSS. A uh, really great panel, and uh, I wondered if uh, I can ask both Mark and Nada what your assessment is of Assad's uh, political future uh, in Syria. Assad's political future. You want to take it first, Nada? Um, I think you said he doesn't have a political future. I don't think he's going anywhere in the short term. I mean, I just... Um, you know, both Ir the Iranian ministers have come out saying we're not wedded to Assad for lifetime. Okay, but that doesn't really mean much. The Russians have come out basically saying, eh, you know, it's negotiable. But at the end of the day, they just spent how much money and how many bodies to support Assad and that government. So in the short to medium term, I don't see him going anywhere. Uh, I really do, as I've been saying, I think both countries are going to double down on Assad and support him. Um, whether or not in, internally they're preparing someone else, uh, possibly. While we're on it, uh, I do not think you're going to have autonomous regions. Uh, just in, I think that kind of came up, not today, but generally it's talked about in the Deir Ezzor area and where the Kurds are, autonomy, you're not going to have that. Uh, nobody wants that. We already dealt with sort of the Iraqi referendum. Everyone has doubled down on the fact that nation states are going to stay the way they are. Um, double IWS had a, a panelist, I think, from the National Security Agency the other week that talked about authoritarianship is on the rise. It's going to stay the way it is for at least the, till the medium term. And I'm going to call that out at like five to seven years. Which I probably shouldn't do, but yeah, five, we'll to seven years, like <laughs> five to seven years. Right. Yeah, I, I, I basically agree. You know, I think that uh, although the Russians sort of have given an indication that, oh, you know, they don't really like Assad, that they would like to see something else. I think, you know, A, it's partly to make themselves look reasonable to others, but also, you know, even if they really were interested in someone else, who else is there? In other words, who, who can replace Assad and, and maintain stability, maintain their interests. And so I, I think that, um, and, and this, they don't want to see any, risk any possibility that the regime could crack. Uh, that this is, in other words, that if, if Vladimir Putin stands for anything, he is the arch conservative, the preserver of established regimes. The Russians constantly refer to the Assad regime as a legitimate government of Syria, which to me is just quite remarkable. There's nothing terribly legitimate about it, but they, this is, they insist on, on, on its legitimacy compared to anything else. And so I think that, that alone, I think, um, will, will, that idea helps preserve, I think, Russian interest in Assad because, you know, it, it, you know even if they want an alternative, what is the alternative? And I think that they're, they're stuck they're going to support him. Let me go back to uh, Nate, something you, you, you kind of downplayed, or you offered an optimistic uh, uh, perspective on the potential for things breaking out in a big way, because the United States doesn't want war, China doesn't want war, uh, the Saudis aren't really um, uh, fomenting a war in Lebanon. But there is this strong view that 
um, there needs to be a pushback against Iran's uh, aggressive actions in the region. And the pushback uh, needs to happen among elsewhere in Syria to, uh, to prevent this uh, land bridge. Um, and the ideas that are being promoted aren't to go to war against Iran, but to have a, 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 a stronger, lasting U.S. presence. Is, do you have any perspective on, on if that uh, eventuates, um, how Iran is going to respond in the event of a, of a, of a U.S. presence in Syria itself? Um, one, I don't think that the United States is going to be staying in Syria. I mean, that, I think from the beginning, that's the problem. Um, we have not had a good long-term or strategic policy in us probably before I was born. Um, and so I think that's part and part of the problem. And more importantly, the United States is not seen as dependable, right? So for everybody who is up in Deir Azor and is thinking, well, you know, the United States still hasn't pulled out. It can do something. And a lot of the conversations that are happening are about what the U.S. can do to push back. But the U.S. doesn't seem to want despite the rhetoric, isn't doing anything tangible to push back. And that's the problem, which is why you have people, the majority of the Syrian population, who doesn't see the United States as supporting them. And they turn to what's happened in Iraq and say, see, they're not dependable. And that's exactly the problem. So when you're up in northeastern Syria and there's discussion, well, you know, the Iranians are coming through, the United States will do something about this. No, they won't. Look at 2006. Look at 2012. The, Iran the Americans weren't there. They didn't help. And so as a result, some of this is seen as, like, the Iranians have this presence because the United States has been retreating. And so unless the rhetoric is matched with actual tangible efforts, the Iranians will keep doing what they're doing, and it will rely on. We'll have to look at things like the new sanctions that went against Bank Sapa because of the missile situation, right? The extent to which putting sanctions back on to Bank Sapa, which we had before, didn't really stop Iran before. So I don't think that that's really going to cut it. Um, and so I think part of the larger discussion that the the intelligence community and the governments are having is if you're not going to go to war against Iran and the sanctions are not working against Iran, the big question is what is going to work? Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have an answer. Yeah, I just think there's <laughs> going to be a lot of, we're going to see a lot of, of, of other activity to try to find something that, that works. That works, yeah. And uh, we just don't know uh, what's going to prevail. Uh, sorry, Mark, first of all, and then we'll go to the... the Can I actually yeah. just say one other thing? Is if the United States did stay and got made more efforts in Syria, that would actually, I think, work somewhere. You know, the Stanley you refer, referenced Napoleon, but we have the cliche that, you, you know, you keep your friends close, your enemies closer. Part of the problem of not talking to Iran is you don't know what Iran's doing. You also don't have a chain of communication. Like, the fact that we have to go through Russia or any other country to kind of speak to the Iranians is a very large problem, whereas it would definitely increase the tension in Syria if there were Americans back tangibly doing things in Syria, but also nobody wants a war. And so it makes, it forces everyone's hand to start talking to each other. There's a difference between communication and complicity and communication and cooperation. You know, when we were talking, you know, um, airspace, uh, last year, before during the elections, the whole conversation about Syria was um, airspace. Well, the U.S. and Russia wasn't weren't necessarily cooperating, but what they were doing was communicating to make sure those jets didn't hit each other. So, at minimum, we can reduce some tension by actually getting involved. Thanks, Nada. Mark, I, I think the problem both with the Obama administration and the Trump administration is that uh, they have each had competing priorities that. Uh, both haven't liked Assad, Obama perhaps more than Trump. Uh, both don't like Iran. Both are against ISIS. But both also sort of like, uh, don't want to have too much American involvement. And the thing is, is that 
that seems to be the priority, both for Obama and for Trump, is that is to avoid a large American involvement in Syria. And if that's the main priority, then, then probably the other ones really can't be achieved all that easily. Now, obviously, there's been a lot of progress against ISIS, but that doesn't you know, change anything with regard to the Iranian position or the, uh, uh, the Assad regime. And I think that, that essentially, you know, when, it, when it comes down to it, if, if in fact the main goal is to avoid American involvement, but we also are, are concerned about Iran, then I think that probably the, the, the default position is that we rely on the Russians to keep them in check, whether we, we you know, whether that's a, 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 a you know, effective policy or not. That's that's the policy that we end up pursuing. Thanks, Mark. I think we have time for maybe one more question uh, in the back row here. Uh, thanks, uh, Bill Courtney from Rand. Uh, Mark, to what extent are the Russians committed to? putting substantial bases at Latakia and Tartus and challenging NATO in the eastern Mediterranean? Francesco, if you can bring the microphone back. Thanks very much. Well, I think that basically, in other words, it's, it's, it's a question of, of beyond Syria. In other words, that, that they, they like having those bases there. It has, it affects the overall competition as they see it with America and the West. In other words, that, that uh, uh, just like the Iranians, uh, you know, their presence in Syria means that we're focusing on Iran and Syria, not in Iran itself. I think also the same thing with these, with these bases is that uh, uh, it, it, it takes the focus away from the uh, immediate vicinity of, of, of Russia itself. Also, it, it just gives them more options. So I think that that you know, and we've seen this going back to you know, you know, to the to the Cold War, and really, actually, even well before, even to Tsarist days. In other words, that that on those occasions when Russia can have a presence in this part of the world, they have valued it, and and not simply because they're interested in this part of the world, but in terms of their overall competition with other great powers. So it seems to me that this is something that they're they're hoping to, uh, you know, uh, if in fact they can nail down these bases, and and there's subsequent change, uh, maybe they can keep these bases. Certainly, you know, I think that you know back when we were in 2012 uh, visiting the, the the Pentagon back in the the optimistic days when we thought that somehow the Assad regime would fall, that, that part of the, I think, the, the U.S. Uh, approach to, to Russia was that, well, just like after Saddam fell in Iraq and you thought you'd lost everything, you got everything that you wanted back, didn't you, in Iraq? We helped you do that. And that the United States really doesn't care if you have those bases either. In other words, that if that would help the Russians uh, bring about change in Syria, then that was a good thing, but you know, obviously that's not going to happen. But I have I have a feeling that that in other words that this is something that they want. Uh, in other words, no matter what the regime is in Syria, that this is something that they're going to they're going to hope to maintain these bases. Now the question, of course, is that you know as with you know, previous Russian involvement in the Middle East, their staying power in the Middle East doesn't depend on the situation in the Middle East. It depends upon conditions inside of Russia itself, as well as in Europe. And if things go badly for them there, they'll probably withdraw again. Thank you. Uh, actually, I think we do have time for one more question, because I think Jennifer's going to ask a good one. And, and <laughs> <laughs> I have great expectations. Uh, I wondered if any of you could talk about chemical weapons use in Syria. I, I was Did hoping you, you would that? ask that, yeah. yeah. ESP. Uh, and, and and then this joint JIM, it's called Joint Inspection Mechanism that Russia had I think has just voted against. Thank you. So another uh, you know very timely example of a Russian uh, involvement by means of diplomatic uh, protection of Assad, uh, preventing the um, joint investigative mechanism from continuing. Uh, Mark, uh, you, you don't have to defend Russia here, but uh, is there anything you can say that to, to shed light on, on why Russia uh, acts this way? Well, you know, I, I think there is a, a difference between now and in 2013, you know, when there was a possibility that, you know, what, once the red line was crossed and Obama was, in, you know, indicated that he would uh, launch a military response, uh, 
Russia comes up with a plan for, you know, for removing chemical weapons from Syria. And of course, the, this is a, a, the Obama administration signs up for it. But what it means, of course, is that we're working with the Assad regime. What I think is significant now in terms of what Russia does, is doing, is that um, they don't even have to pretend, do they? In other words, that they're not worried about the Trump administration intervening against Assad. So they don't have to even have the fig leaf of pretending to be interested in chemical weapons, it seems to me. So it strikes me that, that it, it's a reflection of their, their confidence uh, that, they were, that uh, they were more concerned that Obama might do something. They're not so concerned that Trump is going to do something. So they don't, they, 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 they're in a better position to defend Assad. That's, that's my view. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and I was going to say that I'm, I'm slightly more optimistic uh, than I was at the beginning, partly because uh, we didn't have predictions of, uh, of, a, of a burst out of uh, flames uh, in the region. But uh, I'm more pessimistic because of uh, 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 Russia's uh, overconfidence here. Um, but I'm much more enlightened than I was at the beginning about uh, why um, it's going to be very hard indeed to uh, find uh, a way to uh, separate uh, Russia and Iran in Syria, or separate either of them uh, from Syria. They look like they're both there for the long term. And the United States uh, is not, apparently, but uh, I don't think we've seen the last uh, of this uh, discussion. Uh, we're going to talk about this in Manama, for those of you who are able to go to Manama. We're going to have other uh, discussion meetings about uh, the events in the Middle East. But please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Mark Katz and Dr. Nibble for a very interesting discussion.